Hello and welcome uh, to our um, next series uh, in our 90th anniversary celebration here at the School of Information and Library Science. It is my great pleasure today to welcome back one of our uh, uh, alumna from uh, SILS. Uh, Danny uh, Brecker-Cook is the Associate Lib uh, University Librarian for Learning and User Experience at the U uh, UC San Diego Digital Sorry, I just had a check I wasn't on, on mute. Um, at the UN's, uh, uh, University of California San Diego Library, she previously held uh, instruction related positions at the University of California Riverside Library and the Claremont College's Library. Her research focuses on person centered approaches to library instruction and management. Danny's also the co founder of the Conference on Academic Library Management and co author of the ALA book Learner Centered Pedagogy Principles and Practice with uh, Kevin Michael uh, Clipful. She, uh, she holds an MSLS from uh, UNC SILS, class of 13, uh, and an MA in Education and Research uh, Evaluation, Measurement, and Statistics from uh, UC Riverside. And she also has her uh, e uh, AB in English from the University of Chicago. Uh, outside of libraries, uh, Danny enjoys spending time with her husband and two small uh, humans. Uh, and um, we are very, very um, um, uh, pleased to have her here. She uh, trains for uh, long distance runs and, and um, uh, is uh, happy to be exploring uh, her uh, adopted home state of California. You can follow her on Twitter uh, at uh, uh, Danny I. B. Cook. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Danny. Welcome back, Danny. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, thanks so much for the nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here. And of course, I'd also like to thank Susan for all of her help and support in getting this event set up. Um, I'm so happy to be a part of SILS 90th anniversary celebration. My experience at SILS was really formative for me, both in terms of my formative ed formal education and the connections that I've made with other students, some of whom I know are here today. So thanks for being here, guys. Um, I'm so grateful to get to reflect on some of that with you today and to also explore this idea of person-centered management, um, which is something that um, has been on my mind for the past few years. So my talk today is about person-centered management, um, which is an idea that has been applied primarily to healthcare settings, classroom management, and very brief, briefly in the 90s to a broader variety of workplaces. But it's a relatively new concept for libraries. For those of you who really like management theories like servant leadership or human relations theory, scrum or agile, I think you'll find resonances in this work. Um, and I'm especially appreciative of getting to share these thoughts with you here in a skills related space as my interest in person centered approaches sort of broadly writ um, started right there in Chapel Hill. So I'll talk more about that. Um, so let me start by sharing a little bit about myself and how I became interested in person-centered approaches to management and what precisely I mean by that term. Um, so as Gary said, am I sharing my screen? I did, right? Nope. No. Oh, well, I have all these really nice slides and I didn't share my screen. Um, let's try that again. All right, well now hopefully you can see my slides. Yes? Yes. Yes, yeah. great. yes. Great, okay. Um, so let me, let me try that again. So let me start by sharing a little bit about um, this. So as um, Gary said, I'm the Associate University Librarian for Learning and User Experience at the UC San Diego Library, which means that I do work in the Spaceship Library along with a number of other SILS alumni. Um, and I've been a formal manager for about six years. And like many managers, I didn't really have specific or formal training when I first went into that role. Um, since that time, I've worked with some incredible colleagues to try and make that space for continued learning about management. Um, one way that we've done that is starting the Conference on Academic Library Management or CALM. But back in 2016, which is when I took on a management role, I was an instruction librarian and that's what I had trained for at SILS. Um, and I've kind of felt very lonely making that transition into management. So I'm gonna take you back in time now um, to approximately 2012 at SILS. 
um, where I was fortunate enough to sit behind uh, Kevin Michael Clifball in my cataloging class taught by Wanda Gunther. Um, we became fast friends. We both worked at the undergraduate library um, and we were both very interested in how librarians could approach what felt like you know, the impossible task of one shot instruction and actually have people learn something in that 45 minutes or 75 minutes that we have with them. We really bonded over looking at the educational psychology literature for approaches. And Kevin introduced me to the work of Carl Rogers, who was a mid-century psychologist and the founder of the humanistic psychology movement. Rogers developed a framework for person-centered therapy, which hypothesized that meaningful personality change is only possible um, through authentic human connection and that therapists need to accept people in their experiences as they are in order to have a successful therapeutic relationship. This was really different from all of the folks who had come before who were primarily working in a Freudian style, kind of like the, the therapist knew best, right? So in the Rogerian's tradition, there are three key conditions for a successful person-centered relationship to occur. So first is congruence, meaning that the therapist is genu genuinely themselves while they're with the client. So that includes feeling all of the positive and negative feelings that they might have. The second is unconditional positive regard, meaning that the therapist withholds judgment from the client's experiences. And then finally, empathy, meaning understanding a person's emotional responses without taking those responses on yourself. So one important distinction between Rogerian therapy and other methods is that Rogers takes the client or the person who is coming for treatment as to be the expert on themselves. The therapist is not the expert. The therapist's role is to listen closely and carefully and not to position themselves as having all the answers. Later in his career, Rogers applied that same construct to the field of education and challenged educators to establish those same kind of congruent and empathic relationships to their learners. And this work was really central to both Kevin and myself in our approach to how uh, we taught in libraries. And eventually we wrote a book together that explored this called Learner-Centered Pedagogy Principles and Practice. Um, that shows how you can use these ideas in library instructional contexts, ranging from things like CWS, so classes where people learn how to use computers, um, to higher education contexts, um, as well as at the reference desk. So that's, that's my background, and that's where I came from as SILS. And then when I became a manager, um, my training was my required SILS management course, which I remember most for two things. Um, so one, we had a final project that was super interesting that was about creating a budget. And I definitely thought that budgets would be a big part of my life. And it's only actually in the past year um, that I've actually gotten to work with a budget. Um, so that was kind of interesting. And secondly, I remember the first day of class, we asked, were asked how many folks wanted to be managers and most people didn't raise their hand. Um, and that was really eye-opening to me um, and, and made me uh, consider kind of why that might be. Um, so as I came into this role, I looked around um, the field to see what kinds of professional development opportunities there might be or resources available to learn about the nuts and bolts of management. So things like how to run a meeting, how to have difficult conversations. Um, and mostly what I found was very expensive leadership training that focused on high level vision setting um, that somehow you were supposed to pick up these other skills in other ways. Um, and I'll also just note that I think that this field has expanded a lot in the past five years, and I'm really grateful and I continue to learn from all of our colleagues. But at that time, um, I felt kind of alone, um, and I felt like the tools in my toolkit were those person-centered principles that I'd been using in the classroom. Um, so that was what I tried to use as a manager, um, working with other folks in my department. And it turns out that that idea wasn't terrible and it wasn't original. Um, so in the 90s, there was a brief surge in this idea of person-centered leadership, which was exemplified by Gene M. Plass's 1996 book, Person-Centered Leadership, An American Approach to Participatory Management, where she defined person-centered leadership and management as the individual uh, having an emphasis on psychology tools as well as management tools. It means necessarily that words like heart, caring, needs, and feelings are no longer ignored in the workplace, and they move to center stage. Um, one thing I love about this book is that she posits that this is the ideal management structure for people in the United States because we value the individual above the collective. And, uh, you know, I think it's funny because it's kind of true, um, but I think it's also an important cultural context for us to be thinking about because through focus on the individual class says we can adequately create effective teams. 
Um, so there's definitely some interesting psychology going on there. And I think the insight there is an important one um, that we are very used to thinking of ourselves as individuals and to come into a place that really values the collective or the team can be jarring for folks. And sometimes we don't really know um, how to deal with that. And so person-centered approaches are one way for thinking through that. And I'm gonna talk more about that in just a minute. For our mission statement, person-centered management as a concept basically seems to have disappeared for about 20 years. Um, you can't find much literature about it at all. Um, instead, uh, there were similar leadership theories that took precedence, and some of them you probably heard about before. Um, participatory leadership, servant leadership, um, things that had a lot of the same elements in common. So those elements of care, um, those elements of feeling, um, and a emphasis on process, the increased agency of workers, empathy, and inspirational leadership. A key difference between these theories and person-centered approaches is that they tend to divide organizations into groups of leaders and then workers. And they don't necessarily talk about that each of those categories are made of many different individuals with different life experiences, motivations, and needs. And person-centered management, that's kind of the core of it, um, that all of us have different life experiences, motivations, and needs. And that's what we need to pay attention to as managers and as colleagues. So I also want to say that I'm far from the first person from seeing resonances between teaching and management strategies. Every couple of years, um, you know, someone on Twitter will say, like, uh, I'm an instruction librarian. I've been thinking about writing this piece. Um, and a lot of folks will chime in um, and say, yeah, me too, me too. And um, some folks have actually done that. So I'd love to point you to the 2019 article, Are You Being Served? Embracing Servant Leadership, Trusting Library Staff, and Engendering Change by Yvonne Muleman's and Talisa Matlin which connects servant leadership to constructivist pedagogy, noting that both students and library workers are partners um, with traditional authority figures, whether that's the teacher or the manager in co-constructing the environment in which either they learn or they work. Um, that work has been really important to me. Um, and I uh, especially want to highlight this quote from them where they call upon library administrators to lead by listening, to walk away from a singular vision of what should be done and to be guided by aiding library workers in realizing the mission and vision of a library. So in many ways, I think the work that I'm sharing with you today is building on the work of Muleman and Matlin. Um, and I would propose that person-centered approaches are a concrete way to actualize some of those servant leadership principles and critically and a little bit differently acknowledge that both managers and folks who are managed are both full people. So let's talk a little bit more about the definition of person-centered management. Um, so I'm gonna draw on the work of Rogers as well as some of the works that um, I and Kevin have previously done in um, the realm of instruction. And I would propose to you that person-centered management can be defined as a management philosophy and practice that explicitly acknowledges that we are all unique individuals and that we bring those experiences, preferences, and needs into the workplace with us. In order to successfully create environments where people can fully succeed at work and participate in functional teams, the needs of each individual has to be surfaced and authentically considered. Um, I think when I talk about person-centered um, teaching or person-centered management, there's always uh, a straw man. And I wanna address that right now. So you might hear me say this and say like, well, my needs are to spend as much time doing the things that I like to do, um, whether that might be playing Fortnite, which is what my husband likes to do, or watching the latest season of Love is Blind, which is what I like to do, or working out or baking or gardening or whatever it is that you enjoy doing. Um, but we also operate in a system where we have to work, right? Um, capitalism means that we rent out our labor to organizations so that we have money to survive and then hopefully have time to also do those things that we want to do. So there are certainly constraints to what this means in the workplace. You can't always do, and you can't always facilitate people doing precisely what they want to do. Um, and that's also true in the classroom, but it makes the assumption that everyone who's involved in this agreement understands that agreement, that there are some parameters to how this works. So the framework that I'm going to share with you today, again, explicitly connects to the three elements proposed by Rogers, congruence, unconditional, positive regard, and empathy. And I'm gonna talk about each one in turn to suggest what that might look like in practice for library and library management. Okay, so then I translated them um, to some more action-oriented um, phrases. So 
be authentic, be curious, and be open. So we're going to start with congruence um, or being authentic. So the concept of congruence asks us to be genuine with ourselves. That means, as managers, creating space for yourself to feel your feelings about others, to acknowledge that those emotions exist to yourself, and then consider how they affect your interactions with others. It asks us to acknowledge that we too are individuals. We're not um, sort of robots. Um, one challenge that I've had previously with servant leadership is um, let's talk about how the leader is feeling also um, before we attempt to engage with others because none of us bring nothing into the conversation, right? So we hear a lot, be yourself at work or bring your whole self to work. And I really appreciate um, that change in the way that we think about work, but I also want to acknowledge that depending on your identities, even if you're a manager with some level of positional power, you might not feel safe or even be able to bring that whole self to work. You might not want to. Um, you don't owe that to your workplace or to everyone you encounter. Boundaries are also important. Um, so if it's not just bringing the same version of yourself to every place that you are at work, what else can being authentic mean in a person-centered practice? So Brene Brown has a quote that she shared before that I really like, and the first time I heard it was Katrina Davis Kendrick sharing it um, at a keynote presentation, which is clear as kind. So authenticity can look like providing clarity. Um, so not trying to hide what you need to say in order to soften. Um, so the corollary to clear is kind is unclear is unkind. Um, so making sure that you are authentically sharing the thing that you need to tell someone. Um, other people can't guess what you're thinking. It usually ends poorly. Um, and I think that's something that I know that I have had to work on quite a bit. Um, related, when I was at Sills, I took a class over in the School of Education with Jeff Green. And I always think about this promise that he made the first day of class, which was that he would never ask us a question in class that he already knew precisely the answer to what he was, the, precisely the answer he was looking for. So he didn't want us to keep asking making guesses and um, just trying to get that answer that he already knew. And he called that having the answer in his pocket. Um, and I think about this a lot. And I think that that kind of authenticity is also trust building. And if you know you want something, um, if you know you need something to ask for it, that's an authentic interaction. So authenticity can also look like honesty. So being truthful, for example, about where you can and can't consult people transparently sharing processes, your values, um, and even what has to be confidential, because sometimes even in the most person-centered organizations and libraries, there are gonna be times when, because of HR reasons or other things, information has to stay confidential, can help build that trust. Uh, when you ask for people's feedback, genuinely considering it, um, and coming back and sharing how that feedback fed into a decision, or if not, why not? Um, so a call for authenticity isn't a call for making everyone like you, but it is a call for fairness and transparency. Um, authenticity can also be messy. So as a manager within the library, um, folks are in positions of power. And it's important to acknowledge that dynamic and consider how to make space for uh, yourself as a manager to feel your feelings but not necessarily inflict them on those who have less power than you, right? Like you are a human also, um, but that doesn't mean that you can fully be all the things you might experience um, to those who are not in the same position as you. So for example, um, if you've ever been yelled at by a manager before, which is unfortunately an experience I think a lot of us share um, in the American work context, that feels really bad and maybe scary and threatening. And it's not okay that they did that. Um, that was authentic to them, but it's not okay. Um, it had a negative consequence for the people around them. So everyone is entitled to having big feelings, but not in every space. And there's a lot of considerations to make um, about what those spaces are depending on your position. So we all need trusted colleagues and communities. Um, we need friends. So prioritizing those relationships and allowing yourself the space to be a whole messy person um, and to acknowledge that you have those feelings is part of being an authentic leader. So taking that time to take a step back, um, to have some coffee, drink some water, um, can allow you that space to then be genuine in your interactions with others and not just feel the emotion, to actually hear what they're hearing. Um, it's very hard to have clarity in a moment where um, you're still actively working through all of the emotions that you're having. 
Um, and I will speak from experience. If you think you can power through and hide it, you probably can't. Um, that's not something that most of us are really good at. Um, so it's okay to take that breath, to end a meeting early, to thank people for their feedback and then sit with it. All of those things are important for managers to be able to have the space to do so that you can be fully present with your team and you can continue to build that trust. Um, one of the themes that I'm gonna talk about today is psychological safety. So you are being as authentic as you can be within the parameters of um, the power dynamic. Um, and if the folks who are uh, working with you trust that you're going to behave in a predictable or even keeled way, you're creating that space for them to also be full people. So that brings us to our next frame, which is unconditional positive regard or what I'm calling be curious. So unconditional positive regard asks us to withhold judgment from our colleagues. In a therapeutic context, basically that means that the client is never supposed to feel like they're being judged by the therapist. In a work context, of course, we're often asked to judge people as part of our job. That's what performance reviews are. So what could this mean um, as a person-centered manager? So I'd suggest to you a position inspired by unconditional, unconditional positive regard means taking a tact of curiosity whenever possible. It means assuming good intent. When people do something unexpected or out of character, rather than rushing to judgment, we would ask the question, why did the person do this? Um, we would ask the person like, hey, I noticed that this thing happened and it's kind of unusual for you. Can you tell me a little bit more about what happened? And I would say, especially now in the pandemic, people are dealing with all kinds of trauma and stress. No one's their best self. Everyone's got stuff going on. Some people have no choice but to bring that pain with them into the workplace because it's too much for any person to just lock away. Um, as a manager, I hope we can find spaces to allow people to share that and then help them find solutions. So for example, if a deadline gets missed, rather than immediately moving to anger or discipline, maybe ask yourself, is this truly an urgent deadline? And if it is, how can you help that person get back on track? Curiosity can also mean taking a coaching tact to working with people. So again, managers are human, everybody in this dynamics human, and we none of us have all the answers. But we can ask good questions that help to get to a solution and move forward. Um, curiosity means exploring different solutions and accepting that a preferred idea or solution might not be the best one. So by creating space for people to share their experiences and ideas, knowing that they won't be shut down, you open the possibility for creativity. So one of my favorite exercises as a manager is something that I've borrowed from design thinking, which is to ask a question like, what would you do if you had no constraints? And of course, we all work in organizations that have a lot of budget constraints specifically. Um, and I think that's especially true in 2022. Um, but it can be helpful to imagine what that would look like if it didn't exist. So a greenfield approach and taking each idea as valuable can help lead to viable solutions that you might not have ever considered. So rather than to immediately move to thinking that it's like ridiculous to suggest that a librarian, every librarian in your organization is given a budget to take community members out to coffee, you could think, what's the reason behind this ask? Is it um, because there's not enough space in our organization right now for relationship building? Are there other non-coffee, non-monetary solutions that we could employ? Um, I did this with some students actually yesterday. Um, it was really eye-opening and they had some really big ideas. Uh, and I would say that uh, we could take them a little bit smaller in order to actually um, move on them. And I also wanna say that curiosity and the genesis of unconditional positive regard doesn't mean that you can't performance manage. It's a key part of any manager's job. And I think it can also be an act of care. Um, this frame invites you to consider the way that you performance manage and ask that if you work with an individual, you try to get to some of those root causes for why things aren't going well. And that requires trust. You won't always be able to coach someone into meeting expectations. Um, and it doesn't mean that that person is not a valuable human being. It just means that they're not able to meet their expectations at work right now. Um, your role as a person-centered manager uh, would be to create the conditions where they could succeed and then if they're able to, um, in that moment, decide that that's something they're able to do or willing to do, fantastic. Um, the key is to keep asking questions to ensure that you're doing as much as reasonably possible to create that space for someone. Um, but of course, it doesn't always, doesn't always work. So 
keep asking questions. Um, I think that's something um, I'm also learning and, and dealing with as well. So finally, I wanna talk a little bit about empathy. Um, empathy has become so trendy in all things leadership and management over the past few years. Uh, we often talk about it as walking a mile in another person's shoes. Um, I'm gonna turn back to my old pal, Carl Rogers, who defined empathy in 1975 as to be with another in a way that means that for the time being, you lay aside the views and values you hold for yourself in order to enter another's world without prejudice pretty big lofty um, expectation for someone. I'm not sure that that's something that most of us can reach, especially without special training or maybe intensive psychotherapy. But it also seems true to me that it's worth trying to ask questions and understand where other people are coming from um, so that we can work together to create a space where we all are aiming towards the same things and share those same values. Um, I think we probably can't ever fully understand another person and their lived experiences because we're all really different, um, but we can attempt to find some common ground and we can attempt to listen. We can be open to other people's experiences and accept that their experience is also valid, even if it doesn't align with ours. When people tell you that they experience something and it doesn't align with what you've experienced, I will say like my default move often is to be defensive and it's a process of unlearning. Um, that moment means that there's some kind of um, multiple realities that are being uh, perceived, and it's an opportunity for us to learn. So similar to the previous frame, a variety of experiences gives us that opportunity to ask questions and come to a deeper understanding of another person. And as we learn more about the people we work with, it becomes more possible for us to try to imagine what it might feel like to be that person or people experience something, experiencing something. Um, to get there, uh, you need to have that psychological safety as well. So allowing people to share their thought processes and experiences with you, and you probably do have to reciprocate. It's unfair to expect folks to share with you if you won't share with them. In moments when a decision needs to be made, um, including in the process, time to reflect on how it will impact the people that you work with. Um, if it's possible, it's wonderful to include them in the process to not make assumptions about how folks might experience something um, because we won't ever fully understand the position. Um, of course, sometimes that's not possible. And then creating that space for people to feel their feelings, just like you want to be able to feel um, big feelings, happiness, sadness, anger. Um, it's important for the folks around you uh, as a manager to have that space as well. And I do wanna say that um, you can go through these various frames and you can think about yourself as a leader and sometimes you get it wrong. Um, you can apply a person-centered lens. You can do your best to think about how um, it's going to affect people and you can still mess up and folks can still feel that rupture. Um, and none of us are going to be perfect 100% of the time. And that's why it's called a practice. Um, so a management practice means that we're, we keep trying, we keep learning from failure. Um, and transparently, I will say this just happened to me. Um, I followed things I thought um, I would have preferred, and it turned out not to be the thing that the people I was working with preferred. Um, I centered my experience instead of theirs because I didn't have enough understanding of um, what they needed. And honestly, I think it turned out badly, um, but I hope that we're going to be able to repair that relationship. Um, and I also have to accept that people are people and it's gonna be up to other folks as well to determine what that path forward is. Um, as a manager, what I can do is recommit to the values that I see uh, in person-centered man management practice and then own up to that failure. Um, I think maybe one of the most important things that uh, comes out of person-centeredness is um, we all appreciate being apologized to when we've been wronged. And that's not something that we typically learn in a management class or a leadership course. Um, and for me, that's been a journey as well. Um, so learning how to apologize well and meaningfully and take concrete action um, is an important skill in a person-centered organization. Owning the impact, committing to concrete action so you don't repeat the same mistake over and over again, and then making space for those folks to feel whatever they're going to feel, um, that's not for me to decide. Um, so I love this resource. I've learned a lot about apologizing from Dania Ruttenberg on Twitter um, and other online spaces and definitely recommend Googling her. Um, she has a book coming out this year on uh, repair that I think will be really fantastic. 
So authenticity, curiosity, and openness can all contribute in the library context to creating a feeling of psychological safety. Um, knowing that the first move will not always be discipline or a loss of respect makes it possible for us to um, have people do their best work. Person-centered management asks us to recognize that all of us are complex people, all of our experiences matter, and that we're all worthy of respect, no matter our history, position, or place within the library organization. And you might say, well, why is this an especially useful model for libraries? And I have two thoughts about this. Um, so one reason um, comes from Fobazi Attar's groundbreaking 2018 article, Vocational Awe and Librarianship, The Lies We Tell Ourselves, which posits that many library workers view both their institutions and the people who work in them as uncriticizable because of the nature of the work. So many of us got into libraries because we truly believe in the mission. Um, we think we're doing a good thing. Um, that belief in the inherent goodness of the library, as Attar says, leads to individuals being more likely to accept low pay or being treated poorly, ever increasing job duties, and the erasure of the authentic self when it doesn't align with the white female majority of library workers. Understanding this context, it's especially important for managers and administrators to think about creating spaces and having spaces where people are able to criticize both the institution and the field, and for those experiences and comments to be taken seriously. Person-centered management practices that create space for criticism, sharing of lived experiences, and a willingness to investigate, and if needed, make changes to the status quo, so no more default of, well, this is how we've always done it, can be a powerful tool for addressing that concept of vocational awe. Secondly, there's an aphorism that gets repeated often because it's true, right? Um, people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. So why is that? Managers tend to be our most clear interface with our institutions. They determine our day-to-day -day work, um, how they treat you and what they get away with, like can really influence how you perceive the culture. So you could be in an organization that has an amazing culture, but if your manager is being abusive to you, then it's not a good culture for you. And they can make your day-to-day -day life great or actively unpleasant or even harmful. And we know that this is true specifically in libraries, thanks to the work of Katrina Davis Kendrick on the low morale experiences of public and academic library workers. Wyant Wallace and Woodward's 2021 review article synthesized that existing research, including Kendrick's, and determined that supervisor relationships with employees was one of two major thematic areas that contribute to low morale of library workers from within the library itself. So of course, there's some external factors as well. And most of us who enter management, uh, despite what some people may think, like don't set out to do this, right? Like there's no Mr. Burns moment, like sitting in the office, um, I'm gonna make people uh, miserable, like. That usually is not how people operate, um, but this is apparently how many people feel um, within libraries and we need to take that seriously. So the more tools that we have as library managers in our pocket um, to avoid harm and center the people we work alongside, the more likely we are to avoid these situations. So what's next? Um, right now in the field, I see that there's a lot of folks who are dealing with this issue. Um, I've dealt with this issue in the past. A lot of folks are citing toxic cultures, a lack of support, or an unwillingness to change in spite of the lessons that we've learned and continue to learn in the pandemic um, as reasons why they're thinking about changing careers um, or changing institutions. And these things aren't new, um, but the pandemic brought them to light and remote work gave people the opportunity to rethink what their values were and how they wanted to interact with work. Um, I think it doesn't have to be this way. Um, we don't have to have toxic cultures, we don't have to have a lack of support, and we can change. Um, so much of what we've talked about today has been focusing on people as individuals. But I actually think that now is a moment for collective action. Um, we really see it in the resurgence of the labor movement right now. So way to go, Starbucks, labor union. Um, I would say we need a similar call for community, for managers and administrators in libraries. We're also workers and we can also change things together if we work together, if we build communities and support. Taking a risk by yourself is scary and sometimes it's dangerous and it's in the company of others that we can be brave. Um, and also we can learn from others. And in the contemporary library, it's really the people who make our work valuable. Those who interpret collections, who connect people to the information that they need, who describe the information, who increase access to knowledge, who teach people how to um, achieve that knowledge. And if we want our libraries to grow and thrive, we have to ensure that people, which includes each one of us, have what they need to succeed. And person-centered person approaches can give us the tools to do that. 
And so I know a lot of what I talked about today maybe seems theoretical, and I am actually a really pragmatic and practical person, and I want to assure you that there are lots of practical applications. Um, and there are so many people doing good work in this space. Um, right now, I'd invite you to check out the Conference on Academic Library Management, which includes a YouTube channel of presentations from the last year, which are all highly, highly practical. Um, this uh, registration for this year's event will also open next week. And even though the conference does focus on academic libraries, I think that a lot of the practices would be applicable in any library context, and we do share that same background as library workers. Um, I hope that you might find them useful as well. So I want to thank you for the time and space to share with you today and work out some of these thoughts. And I'm really grateful to take any questions or feedback from you. Um, and I also have uh, some quick selected references for you. So with that, um, thanks so much. Danny, thanks so much. That, uh, that was fantastic. Um, boy, I, I've heard that uh, many times uh, from students. Uh, no, I don't want to be a manager. But you uh, exemplify um, uh, what often happens uh, in that we, we uh, as we grow and develop, become managers. And um, uh, uh, thankfully, uh, we are very, very fortunate that um, uh, you uh, uh, chose to do that, and I'm sure that uh, uh, the folks in, in um, your library uh, benefit enormously. Um, there are the um, people can ask questions uh, either through the chat or the Q and A. Um, this session <clears throat> is recorded, and so you will be able to um, uh, have the slides. Uh, I, uh, Danny, I don't know if you uh, want to make your slides available a, 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 another way. Uh, that was uh, sure, one question that just came up in the chat. Um, yes, I can. I have to figure out, this is the first time I've given a presentation in Canva, um, so let me figure out how to do that, but then I'll be happy to. Great, thank you. You know, I, I, uh, as you were talking, I, I, was, I was just, you know, I wanted to go reach for my uh, dog-eared copy of uh, Freedom to Learn, and uh, so happy that, uh, you know, you, you discovered that uh, 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 at your time here at, here at SILS, but this whole participatory leadership uh, concept is just, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, it's not just prescient, it's, it's actually really important for the kinds of trauma that I think we're, we're all uh, uh, coping with today. Um, I, I guess one thing that um, I, I'm, I'm a little curious about is, you know, um, how do you um, practice participatory uh, leadership in a, in a, you know, a time of Zoom and where, you know, we're, we're not together to have um, uh, that, that kind of, um, uh, sort of high touch uh, 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 thing that's, that seems to me that's so important in, in, in this style of, of, of management? Yeah, that's a great question, Gary. And I, I just want to say, like, I am certainly still a person who is learning a lot from my colleagues every day, and I, I definitely don't get it right every time. Um, but I do think that uh, we've all had to learn how to live with Zoom. And in my case, I started my position during the pandemic, there are folks who I work with who I still haven't met in person. And I am, you know, by trade, a classroom teaching librarian. I love some post-it notes. I love some active learning. Um, but we are so fortunate to have um, so many tools um, that we've uh, been able to use during the pandemic that kind of mirror some of those things. And I think that there is extra work that goes along with that, though. Um, so creating opportunities for people to uh, review materials asynchronously to have time to think. Everyone has different schedules right now. In the part of the pandemic, people were, had a lot of caregiving duties that they had to balance. Um, so creating those opportunities for whatever modality people feel most comfortable with, um, whether that's a face-to-face -face on Zoom or whether that's contributing to a Google Doc um, or um, you know, one of I'm totally blanking on one of the many uh, post-it note related apps. Um, I think that those are all opportunities. Um, I do think that we are, I think as we talked about before the session started, Gary, um, like especially for folks who haven't met each other yet, um, we do miss some of those in-person cues and those opportunities to get to know each other as individuals. Um, so I think we have to make space um, to do that as well. And there's actually um, on Slack, a tool that I really love that we use at UC San Diego called um, uh, it's called Coffee Buddies or Donut. Um, mm -hmm. So it uh, randomly matches you with somebody in the organization, and then you're supposed to go have virtual coffee with them for 30 minutes and not talk about work. I mean, you could talk about work, but you should take advantage of that not to talk about work. Um, and so I think that those kind of connections 
and being um, really careful about making sure that you make space for them um, is really an important way for us to move forward because we're all going to work hybrid in some way, shape, or form, I think, in the future. Um, I'm not sure that we'll ever have a day unless we are really intentional about it where we have everybody on site at the same time. Um, but that's always been true, right? We have night workers. Uh, we have folks who work on weekends. And so we have to make space um, for, for having that. So somebody answered the question about what the tool is called, Donut, um, and, and, um, and I think we're seeing this in some conference uh, sorts of uh, uh, tools as well, like uh, uh, Hopin, which is a company that does virtual conferences, has uh, these kind of um, personal connections where are kind of random, where you, you sort of have that um, meeting somebody accidentally in a, in a hallway type of experience. Uh, and I think we'll see more, many more of the, those things in, in the future. Um, uh, you know, uh, Danny, if you, if you want to just send uh, Susan your slides, um, um, then people who want them, there are a couple of people who said they'd really like to have them. Uh, they can just send mail to Susan. That way you don't have to worry about it. And, and uh, she'll do that it's, if you're comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thanks so much for suggesting that. I was trying to multitask here and download them at the same time and figure out how I can upload them. So that's a better plan. Thank you. You know, the other thing that I guess I was um, wondering a, a little bit about is um, uh, I can see how, um, you know, this, this participatory ma management uh, and leadership uh, can really be uh, attractive and build a strong community and, and, and uh, work group. Um, how, uh, yeah, are there strategies or things that you've sort of um, uh, come across to help buffer the maybe toxicity <laughs> that uh, comes from above? Uh, I mean, is, is there, are there any strategies or, or things that, that a manager can do to kind of, you know, help um, sort of, um, you know, protect people from, from things that are, you know, beyond their control? Yeah, I think that's a really important question to ask. Um, and, you know, we all have bosses, right? I don't think Jeff Bezos is in this session, so we all have bosses. <laughs> um, and um, some are, are better than others at, at doing the work of management. Um, and uh, for better or worse, I think part of the role of the middle manager is to provide that umbrella for the people who are below them. Um, and that's maybe part of why um, managers tend to be compensated a little bit more. Um, but um, I think being transparent about where you can and can make, can't make change um, can be a helpful way to talk about that. Um, and really focusing on like what is in the locus of control for the team, for the manager. Um, you can have a really fantastic culture within a department in a library that's not great. Um, so um, I think that there are those opportunities to build those connections within a smaller group. Um, it's really challenging though, and I think we've really seen this again during the pandemic when there are policies, um, for example, that come from a super high level that um, an individual isn't able to change. And I think in that case, the thing that's most honest and most authentic and true is to be clear that you can't make those changes, that you'd be happy to work and advocate with the folks who need them to change. Um, but also not making any promises that you can't fulfill. And that can be really hard because people often do look for, to their managers to make um, that happen. And sometimes it's just not possible in the you know, clearest kind. I really like that. Um, and being truthful and not leading folks on, I think is really important. Yeah, thank you for that. Um... Well, I, I, I hope that um, um, uh, many of the folks uh, uh, out there are participants. Uh, a lot of your uh, your former classmates uh, uh, and yeah, folks I know. Thanks know, for coming. Yeah. Yeah, um, are are on, on the um, uh, the the Zoom um, uh, webinar. Uh, I love the uh, the COM uh, acronym uh, for the, uh, the the conference on academic library management. And I hope uh, many of you will uh, uh, take a look at that. Uh, you know, even if you're not a manager or don't aspire to be, you never know. You you might end up with those uh, responsibilities. And now you have a colleague here who's got great uh, advice uh, and experience. And uh, uh, Danny put the um, uh, 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 URL in, in, in the chat. So um, I don't see other questions. Uh, I think with that, uh, we will call this a wrap. 
Danny, thank you so much uh, for your wisdom and your advice, all the great work you're doing. We're very, very proud of, of you as a SILS uh, alum and uh, look forward to maybe seeing you here in Chapel Hill at some point. And lots of uh, applause coming from, uh, from folks in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the chat. Uh, hopefully this will also um, get uh, uh, some folks who have uh, drawn apart over the years uh, back together again. So thank you again and everyone have a wonderful day. Bye. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much for having me.